to prevent loss of life. So the, the militarization, um, not, nec not, not necessarily, I would say, not to look at it always in a negative manner. Yeah, some things we don't need. But some things we do need, a Bearcat is useful because it gives you that opportunity to, to egress into that situation and it gives you that opportunity to do it safer than you would if you were to be walking up there six stacks and, and, and exposing yourself. Now, I, I, and I get that. I mean, you know, you, you got to have the equipment to do what you need to do. That's not what I'm, I'm talking about. I'm talking about that attitude of militia. Not so much as, you know, what you bought, you know, with what it, or what you need, but the attitude of militia, which is, is, is a specific attitude. Well, I, think a to, I think we got to look at a couple of things there, right? Like historically, we have to look at a couple of things. One of the things we have to look at is the purveyance, to, like the economic system that produced this in the police departments, right? Like, so let's go talk Reagan, let's talk war on drugs, right? Let's really have this conversation um, that fuels some of these things, right? We didn't see the ramping up of our police departments until the 80s and the 90s, right? With this quote unquote war on drugs, right? Um, where we know most of the offenders, uh, drug offenders that we find are nonviolent uh, criminals, right? Like, they, we do not have. Uh, violent criminals that are, that are largely connected with this drug thing, but there's this quote unquote war on drugs, right? So our language that we use, the economic drivers that we use to protect this uh, policy and property fuel that quote unquote militia mentality. I think the next piece is that we see, though we sell a lot of these things to entities, right? We, we also are selling it to some places where the training is just low. And so there's not an accountability for where we send some of this equipment, where the government, the federal government, let's not talk local, it's like the federal government not only gives the police department the money to buy these things, but they're like, hey, buy it from us, right? And so um, the training does not match in every single department. There are departments that are highly trained, that are highly equipped to handle this, and they use it for de-escalation. There are other departments um, that are not trained, they are not equipped, and they don't have the right mentality to do this, but there's not any federal accountability, right? And then there's always this turf war about, um, we don't want the feds telling us what to do locally, and they need to mind their own business, and, and vice versa. And so there's a lot that fuels this mentality, right? And a lot of it is really based on this mythological fear factor that's been pushed, right? I'm afraid for me and mine. I'm afraid for my life. I'm afraid um, for these things. And so this fear factor that's pushed in there really continues to ramp up uh, this mentality of, as you call it, militia. Um, some people call it the armament of uh, uh, the militarization of police. I think um, I would call it really a lack of uh, using resources because we're basing it not off the numbers, but off of fear often. Greg, I think, I think and Paul mentioned a shift, um, you know, and I think that you're right. There, there, there was a shift. This community policing uh, tag was really developed in Kansas City in the 70s. Uh, that's where community policing started, community policing model. And so police started buying into this, you know, police officers getting up, walking the streets, uh, to be cop. Um, the Kansas City, Missouri was really the home for how this whole thing spread. And then you had September 9-11. And from that point, you can environment mentioned policy. Now you have the, the government saying, <coughs> local police, now you're the front line uh, protectors for terrorism. And that's when the floodgates opened after 9-11 for a lot of this militarized equipment to really become more available uh, to local law enforcement that I don't think was really ready yet to have some of these types of equipment because of policy, because of bad training. But now the shift is going back to community policing efforts, um, getting out of the cars and engaging with the community, getting back to that uh, guardian type police and uh, you know so and there are a lot there are a lot of research and there's a lot of articles being written on guardian versus warrior uh, when it comes to uh, police and how we police our communities and, and I think now the shift is and the emphasis now is getting back to guardian being the warrior when you need to be 
because that's what people want. But for the most part, 99% of the time, it, it's getting back in the pool. I have a question, question for Brigner. Um, is Officer Friendly still in the elementary schools or has that ceased? And if it has ceased, does Valparaiso and the community, I mean, does the community of Valparaiso plan on implementing that again? Well, that, uh, I used to be officer friendly. Uh, <laughs> and I even did Mike the Bike uh, years ago. And we still, I mean, that's a term. Uh, I would like to think that that isn't just designated to one or two people anymore. Uh, I can like speak for our department that we encourage that throughout the organization that every officer be engaged to some degree with either young people, um, you know, engage in neighborhoods. But years ago, it used to be like one officer was officer friendly. And, um, but now that that's a culture or philosophy, I think that is spread throughout an organization or department, you know, and I believe ours uh, in, in different roles. We have two full-time police officers in the schools uh, school resource officers. We teach the great program in the seventh grade, uh, gang resistance education and training. It's a curriculum that the schools have implemented. Uh, we'd like to move to fifth grade. Uh, we have an adopt a school program where you know every school in the, in the city limits has an officer that assigned to that school and spends time in that school when they can, uh, either having lunch or a meeting with teachers, uh, parents just meeting with the kids. Uh, so there are, there's a lot of engagement, but it isn't just officer friendly anymore. Uh, it's really, um, that philosophy has kind of uh, been spread out to, to all the officers to some degree, mm -hmm. which is very important. To yes. One last question. My, my question would be for any cop that's in here, do you guys get tired of arresting the, the, the small guy? meaning the guy that doesn't have the resources to bring the drugs into our community, does it ever click in the head and say, let's turn it off and let's go towards our government, like somebody like Oliver North with the war on drugs with Reagan that never did a day in jail. And so sometimes when we're arresting these guys that sell and dime bags and nickels, they don't have the resources to bring that even to our community. When does it stop and say, we're gonna go after our government that's truly bringing the drugs into our country? Because the people selling drugs on the corner don't have airplanes. Right? Mm -hmm. Planes are supposed to be searched before they come into our country. Does it ever say, like, we want to stop getting them? Let's get this guy in our government that's actually doing it. Let's get the people that are systematically doing this thing. I don't well, know what anybody's saying. That kind of <laughs> there was no way anybody can answer that. You probably got a lot of people who can. Well, in that kind of a situation with investigations like that, you have to start off small and work your way up the food chain. Mm -hmm. You arrest your dime bag person who takes you to the person who's dealing the pound. Mm -hmm. You arrest the guy who's dealing the pound, that person takes you to the guy who's you know dealing hundreds of pounds. And you gotta work your way up the food chain. But, but in that, how do we all know Oliver North's name, but he never did a day in jail? So what, what, what do you do for that? I guess that, that's my question. And that's what's so hard and disheartening when you, even if you stop the guys in our community, or it takes Chicago, for example, with this, the shooting that just happened, for that to be covered up, or you take all the police cameras, how are people still selling drugs in Chicago with police cameras? Is it really about catching the guy, or is it really about not to make it seem politically correct? And that's what's disturbing to me. So if I go visit my parents on the west side, why do I still see 10 guys on the corner selling drugs with a camera right above them? Why aren't they in jail already? So what's really going on politically at the government level, at the feds level? And that's why I get confused. And uh, Tom Byron said something earlier that is very important that may have um, passed over everybody, and it was about voting. Mm -hmm. Because the things that you're talking about, um, you we need to uh, vote people in who have a similar mindset, who see that negative. As a young man, um, and I was um, very active um, as a as a young guy in college, doing um, a lot of social uh, things. Right, not social and party. I did that too, but I'm, I'm saying social activism and things like that. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that you are saying, because um, that was shortly after the time that I was in college, was shortly after and during that time that you're speaking on. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, as a young person, not um, as an ignorant young person, I was thinking that I think this is a pretty easy thing to do. 
I'm thinking if we, if our country is having a problem with this particular thing, then we as a country will be able to solve that thing, right? And I'm thinking it should be pretty easy. This is a, 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 a field of opium, right? Po a poppy field, right? I'm thinking, boom, it ain't that no more. But now I realize that it's a lot bigger than that. And uh, yeah, that would be an easy thing to do, but what else happens after that? And the important thing to do, and accountability, and, and not allowing wrong to be made right, right? If you selling a dime bag, you wrong. Right. If if you selling ten keys, you wrong. It don't matter. Right. The level of wrong don't matter. Wrong is wrong. Right. Um, and they can bring in and we and um, history and and uh, it's well documented how some drugs began how some drugs began to overtake um, our city mm -hmm. and and believe and I know that and I'm right there with you in that. Mm -hmm. But you can put. 10 pounds of cocaine on that table right now. Mm -hmm. It's just gonna be 10 pounds of that cocaine on that table right now if don't nobody touch it, mm -hmm. and if don't nobody sell it. Mm -hmm. So um, you can't have, okay? You cannot have a, a cocaine dealer, a, a weed dealer, which will probably be legal in about 17 months, I don't know. Um, you can't have a, a heroin dealer or anything else. You can't have anybody pushing prescription medications if you don't have somebody that's willing to take it. And that's what uh, he was saying, is that you have, who do you have to look at in order to get up the food chain? I can't go to, uh, to Chicago right now, mm -hmm. over on Lakeshore Drive, 